My name is J.P. Michaud, and I'm a professor of entomology at Kansas State University. The purpose of this presentation is to explain how the combination of host plant resistance and biological control should eventually maintain sugarcane aphid populations below economic levels. As you can see in this picture, the middle two rows of plants are holding up pretty well, while those on either side look pretty bad. That's the difference host plant resistance can make. When host plant resistance traits are employed in tandem with conservation biological control tactics, the two have synergistic impacts on the aphid population and can prevent it from reaching economically damaging levels. This presentation will explain how the two tactics complement each other. I want to start with a quote from the original paper in which the entire concept of integrated pest management was developed. By changing or manipulating the environment, man has created conditions that allow certain species to increase their population densities. Which is a polite way of saying that agriculture creates pest problems. So if I can be a bit more blunt in 2017, I would say that modern industrial scale agricultural practices are the primary selective force driving the evolution of our pest problems. In particular, large synchronous monocultures create ideal habitat for aphids to escape their natural controls. We know this to be true because aphid outbreaks like the current invasion of sugarcane aphid are extremely rare in natural ecosystems, but quite common in agriculture. I often say that natural biological control is the best aphid control there is. Beneficial insects are the equivalent of unpaid farm workers, and they don't pose any of the environmental hazards of insecticides. However, predatory insects can be disadvantaged by our farming activities, attempts to control other pests, and weather anomalies. Natural aphid control is only obtained by the simultaneous response of many different natural enemies. I like to say that aphid biocontrol is not rocket science. It's connect the dots, and there are only three of them. Biological control of aphids requires insect diversity, and if you want insect diversity, you need some plant diversity. Of course, this can be difficult to achieve in our synchronous monocultures that are so heavily reliant on herbicides. When we have aphid outbreaks due to a newly invasive species like sugarcane aphid, many people jump to the conclusion that the natural enemies are ineffective, simply because there's so many aphids. But this is not a valid conclusion. Invasive species initially disrupt local insect communities, destabilizing many of the normal mechanisms that govern the abundance of different species. Fortunately, many of these imbalances are only temporary as beneficial insects gradually evolve to make better use of the novel food source, ultimately bringing the invasive aphid under control. Now, if you are doubtful about this, I will point out that we already have many species of aphid under natural control in our field crops, to the extent that they rarely, if ever, require treatment. Note that most of these species were at one time major pests, either upon their initial arrival in North America or following a host shift to a new plant species. In many cases, resistant plant varieties were developed that aided the process simply by slowing down the aphids. Aphids have a very intimate relationship with their host plants that involves many complex molecular interactions between the insect and the plant. At very least, even the most passive of aphid species must establish a feeding tube, called a stylet sheath, which forms by an interaction of aphid saliva with plant wound response compounds and functions just like the casing in an oil well. And that is before the more complex process of feeding begins. Once the stylet sheath is established and the phloem elements penetrated, more aggressive aphids like sugarcane aphid essentially engage the plant in a tug of war for its own resources such that an established aphid colony exerts a strong sink effect on the plant that channels nutrients away from other plant parts. This is why grain fill can be reduced 
even though the aphids remain on the leaves. However, with this complexity comes vulnerability. Even small genetic changes in the plant can have a dramatic impact on the aphid's ability to feed, and the multiple pathways involved mean that there are very many ways that this can occur. As you can see here, the green peach aphid feeding on Arabidopsis uses at least eight different molecular pathways, parts of which take advantage of the plant's own enzymes to interfere with the defensive responses of the plant. Any genetic change in the plant that inhibited any one of these mechanisms would result in a degree of aphid resistance and be manifest in reduced aphid performance. So now you can understand why many different small genetic changes in plants can make it harder for aphids to feed on them, meaning the aphids do not thrive. However, most resistance traits provide only partial protection. You can see the resistance sorghum in this tray is still green, but it will eventually die as well if the aphids continue to feed. So they need some help from above. And I'm not talking about divine intervention here but assistance from higher trophic levels, in other words, predators and parasitoids, to eat the aphids. So this slide really speaks for itself. We need a lot of in different insects responding to an aphid infestation, and we need them to respond quickly. We know that once aphid colonies established, their populations grow exponentially and will quickly reach levels where biological control is impossible. The aphids are simply being born faster than they can be eaten. This means we need a lot of different natural enemies to arrive early in the process of colony establishment, consume all of the aphids before they reach that point of escape velocity. Fortunately, a lot of generalist predators will consume aphids when they become available, while others like most of those pictured here, specialize in feeding on aphids over other insects. The other important point to remember is that these species are not migratory like the aphids, but are year-round residents that must find somewhere to survive in our local agroecosystem when the aphids are not available. These curves depict the trajectories of aphid colony growth on susceptible and resistant plants, respectively. Growth is slow initially because the immigrant aphids have wings and a low reproductive rate. However, when their wingless daughters mature, the colony begins the exponential growth phase. Eventually the plant dies, all the aphids develop wings once again and abandon the plant. The dashed yellow line represents the critical aphid density at which colonies will escape biological control. Because plant resistance impedes aphid feeding, this point of no return occurs significantly later in time on the resistant plant. This means the resistant trait buys you time, more time for the beneficial insects to arrive and eat the aphids before this inflection point is reached. Now let's see what happens over time when resistance traits are employed with and without the support of natural enemies. So this is applied evolutionary ecology. In this diagram, the width of the blue arrows indicate the strength of selective forces acting on the aphid, both from below, from the plant, and above, from the natural enemies. The red arrows indicate the responses of the aphid population. So we start out with a newly invasive aphid. All the plants are susceptible and the biological control is initially weak. So the aphid proliferates out of control. So the first thing we do is introduce a resistant trait into the crop. And this works at first. You get fewer aphids, but these varieties impose strong directional selection on the aphids. And with just a small genetic change, we can get a new biotype. And the aphids become virulent again, post-plant resistance fails, and the aphids proliferate. Now, let's suppose that through changes in economic agronomic practices and improved conservation, the natural enemies become more effective. 
Not only do we get fewer aphids, but the selective pressure to evolve virulence is relaxed. The strong selective force is no longer from the plant below, but from the natural enemies above. And there is no small genetic change that can render aphids immune for predation, so aphid numbers are held at low levels and plant resistance sources remain effective. So the key message is this. Not only does host plant resistance improve the effectiveness of biological control, but biological control preserves the effectiveness of host plant resistance traits in evolutionary time. Now, let's examine the situation of sugarcane aphid in the historical context of other aphid pests against which host plant resistance was deployed. Back in the 1950s, the invasion of spotted alfalfa aphid posed a serious threat to alfalfa production. Resistant varieties were developed that reduced the need for insecticide and biological control gradually improved to the point where this insect is now merely a curiosity. When Greenbug first began attacking sorghum in 1969, it quickly became the key pest in this crop and remained so for almost 30 years. At least five different biotypes of Greenbug evolved in response to a sequence of specific resistance traits that were bred into commercial hybrids. This treadmill continued until widespread changes in agronomic practices in the late 1990s led to improved biological control of green bug. The last virulent biotype was recognized as biotype K in 1998, but it disappeared and has not been collected for over 10 years. Consequently, the last resistance trait utilized against green bug and sorghum remains effective to this day. Russian wheat aphid arrived in Texas in 1986 and remained a serious pest of wheat on the high plains for about 10 years. Once varieties were developed that resisted leaf rolling in response to Russian wheat aphid feeding, the aphid quickly became under effective biological control and its geographic range contracted to a small region along the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. Note that breeding plants for resistance to these aphids is no longer considered necessary. So why is the situation different with sugarcane aphid? Well, it usually takes five to 10 years to find a source of resistance and move it into the crop. Given these time constraints, only one resistance trait was typically deployed at a time, and it was put into all commercial hybrids, creating strong directional selection on the aphids to overcome that specific trait. In the case of sugarcane aphid, we appear to have multiple sources of resistance fortuitously expressed in various commercial hybrids. The odds are that many of these traits represent completely different resistance mechanisms. So they aren't going to combine to exert strong selection on the aphid population in a single direction. So not only do we avoid the need to search for resistance traits and move them into commercial lines, but the various types of resistance present should make it much harder for the insect to overcome them. So the prospects are good for a timely resolution of the sugarcane aphid problem. Just remember that our large synchronous monocultures tend to favor long-range colonists such as aphids, whereas our numerous aphid natural enemies are year-round residents that require local conservation. They need to move between winter and summer crops, and they share a need for plant and floral resources, especially when aphids are scarce. They will be favored by strips of flowering cover crops and increased levels of plant diversity in marginal areas. When insecticide applications are necessary, use products that are listed as selective for beneficial insects. A number of such products are now available for most of our major pests, including aphids and headworms, and these should be selected instead of older, more broad-spectrum materials, even if they are a bit more expensive. The survival of a natural enemy's post-treatment will aid in the control of pests that survive the treatment themselves, and will reduce the need for subsequent applications. So plant-resistant varieties 
But don't forget that you still need to scout them and manage them the same as if they were susceptible. That concludes this presentation on the synergies between plant resistance and biological control in management of sugarcane aphid on sorghum.